Georgia's DBHDD is urging people to store and lock away all medications to prevent theft and keep them away from children and pets. Old medications can be disposed at Dropbox locations. Dropbox locations can be found at opioidresponse.info. This is Georgia Today. I'm Steve Fennessy. Like millions of other Americans, you've probably spent a lot of time at home during the pandemic. And chances are good you've also done a little home improvement over the last year. The remodeling market and housing sales are booming. And all this demand has sent the price of lumber and other wood products to all-time highs, which should be good news for tree growers across the South, right? Wrong. The landowner, us, we haven't benefited from the increase in the price of lumber. So who on the lumber supply chain is benefiting from the pandemic building boom? How is all this affecting Georgia's critical lumber industry? For this episode of Georgia Today, I'm joined by Wall Street Journal's Ryan December. He covers housing, timber, and raw materials for the journal. So, Ryan, I'm relying on you to help me understand what in the world is going on with the price of lumber in the United States. On the one hand, costs were skyrocketing there for a while. They were at record highs. And builders, they couldn't get raw materials. Homeowners were waiting around for jobs to get finished, for for jobs to get started. And so I'm thinking this is all probably a great time to be in the business of growing trees for lumber. So why isn't it exactly? The simple answer is there are a ton of trees and they're ready to cut right now. A lot of trees are the same age. And, you know, we had a, a huge housing bust that hit its nadir about a decade ago. The story begins in the spring of 2008, after the housing bubble had burst. Wall Street had gambled heavily on home mortgages, especially risky ones. What if there were a run on any of the Wall Street houses? Mortgages are triggering fears of a financial meltdown. Everybody made tons of money in 05, 06. By 07, the party was over. And in that 10 years, up until pretty recently, we weren't building a lot of houses in this country. And the trees just kept growing. You know, in Georgia, you're talking slash and loblolly pine. Those trees are usually get to be the size to make lumber and saw timber after about 25, 30 years. And they were ready to cut right around the time that the housing market crashed. And now we have sort of a tremendous glut of of pine trees that are ready to become two by fours and other boards for construction. So that's pushed down the price that mills have to pay for their raw material, for the logs. That's just led to a buyer's market for logs. You said that a a lot of the the pine trees that were that are maturing now and in the last ten years were planted roughly 30 years ago. Why were so many trees planted then? You remember the farm crisis from the 80s. The farm crisis of the 1980s accelerated a long-established trend of farmers leaving the land and farms being consolidated. And one of the responses of the federal government was to take some of the farmland out of rotation. Landowners, they said, hey, if you plant native grasses or trees, we will pay you will pay you a little bit every year to grow trees on your land and stop growing soybeans and glutting those markets. And and a lot of farmers in the Southeast took them up on that offer. And it's resulted in a very unusual market distorting glut of trees. In some cases, there's landowners that have trees that basically aren't worth being cut right now. Well, I'm confused because, uh, you know, you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and the price of a two by four is is exorbitant compared anyway to a year or two years ago. Yeah, so what's really happening is there's a pinch point in the supply chain, and that's at the mills. Originally, when when the first colonists came, the South was covered in a primeval forest of longleaf pine that went from, say, Virginia down to Florida and across into Texas and Oklahoma. And that got nearly logged out, basically to grow food and to supply wood around the world and, and to build the, you know, the early cities and the railroads and, and all that. The, the, you know, the British Navy availed itself to the, the pine trees of the South. And you know, starting in the 30s, we started to replant the South to develop this paper industry. Um, in more recent years, you know, the value of the timber has been 
has come up and been more desired. You know, southern pine is great for building decks and fences, and it's very strong. So people use it in apartment complexes where strength is, is paramount on sort of bottom floors. And over time, the importance of lumber has gone up to the, you know, the South's economy. So lately, we lost a lot of independent mills. You know, some mills just folded up. They weren't efficient enough to compete. They, they sold them off to the big companies from Canada. And that has, has helped give the mills pricing power. What was the situation going into the beginning of the pandemic? And how did the industry imagine what was going to happen and what actually did happen? Before the pandemic, most of us have trouble imagining what that was like, but it looked like the housing market was finally coming back. Well, then all of a sudden, here comes COVID. Everything shuts down. A sawmill is not a work from home type of business, right? You have to be there, uh, so to speak. Uh, and, and they had to shut down just like all the other businesses. It was a great period of uncertainty. One thing that a lot of people felt certain about was that Americans weren't going to be rushing out and buying new homes. And then the opposite happened. People did go out and buy homes. A lot of people were looking around, you know, in their in their apartment buildings and cities saying, you know, maybe I don't want to share a building with a bunch of other people if there's a pandemic. Maybe if I'm going to work from home, I want to have a home office and a yard for the kids to play in and somewhere for the kids to have, you know, their home schooling. You have people stuck at home who are like, you know what, let's finally build that deck. Let's redo the kitchen. And they're running out to Home Depot and buying wood. And then you have like all these restaurants in cities across the country that are doing something that they had never done before, which is build decks and patios and mass. Uh, and the sawmills and the whole supply chain were not prepared for that. And that was a tremendous shock of demand. The mills have had this very unexpected and very sharp surge in demand for wood products during the pandemic. No one saw that coming. No one in the industry, home builders didn't see it. Uh, Lowe's and Home Depot didn't see it. But it happened, and it sent the price on just a crazy arc this year. How high were they getting compared to you know historical averages? So we had a big run-up last summer, and it sort of fizzled out in autumn, which is sort of a seasonal thing you expect because the big swaths of the country, you stop building houses and decks you know, come autumn. And then in the winter, it started moving up again, and it was very unusual, and it just kept going and going. And by May... We got up to a lumber future, a thousand board feet of wood on a two by four dimension. It topped out about $1,700. Now, to put that in perspective, when we were seeing $1,600 and $1,700 lumber, the average should have been around $360, $380. So you're talking more than four times the normal price for two by fours. It's such a fundamental part of the economy, home building and, and, and renovations. And so what happens with, with builders, with, with renovators? Well, builders kept going. And one thing that really helped mask this all was, you know, the Fed keeping interest rates at, you know, historically low levels. So builders were able to pass along those costs for a while. With our area constantly growing, that means a price increase for homes is happening here, too. The market was so hot that people were just paying up. But around May and June, when prices got really out of hand, you started to see builders do really unusual things where they would stop selling houses on spec, saying, OK, you want to buy a house in our subdivision. We're not going to give you a price or sign a contract until we get the studs up or till we're ready to put drywall or till we've got the foundation poured because they were having such a difficult time predicting their costs. Like Landed Gentry, which is building about 60 homes in this new development in Skagit County. There were a few instances where we did not make a profit on the houses. And that's why Landed Gentry had to change its business model. They can't afford to do pre-sales anymore. So what we do is we have lot holds or lot reservations. Once we're close enough to completion, we can actually release them for sale. How is the industry responding in terms of sawmills, which had initially, in the early days of the pandemic, scaled back their work? How have they responded, and, and what effect is that having now on the market? The lumber industry really ramped back up. They're sawing as fast as they can. We saw some, some decline in the repair and remodel business because think of what we all did. The pandemic eased. People got vaccinations. They booked vacations. They went to baseball games. They started going to restaurants again, spending money outside of the home. So we've seen demand cool down there uh, a little bit. 
you know, the flip side is apartment builders are back because they, they canceled projects. Now we're starting to see some of those building permits get pulled. It's back to a precedented range that sort of fits with what we think of as a price for lumber, but it's still on the high side of history. I know you spent some time um, talking to growers and what did you learn from them? What was their, their take on everything that's been going on the last year and a half or so in their industry? Growers have been waiting for the home market to come back for about a decade, right? What really has like surprised people is that the housing market has come back so strongly and that what they call stumpage prices or the prices for the timber, the logs, have not followed them. That's in constant dollars. That's not taking into account inflation and other things that have gone up to grow those trees. Imagine if you were paying 7 or $8 a gallon for gasoline in your car, and then you picked up the newspaper and you're reading about oil drillers going bankrupt. That's sort of what's happening. Georgia in particular, you know, Georgia's about two-thirds covered in trees, and individuals and families own like half of that. We're talking about people who own 40 acres, 100, or 10,000 even, you know, family sort of businesses. And a lot of growers are at a crossroads of, is this a business to stay in and to put my family and my heirs into? Are we playing on a level playing field? Are we able to put our trees into a truly competitive marketplace? Next, why falling lumber prices won't necessarily mean cheaper homes. This is Georgia Today. I'm Steve Fennessy. Georgia's DBHDD reminds people that the Good Samaritan Law can save lives during alcohol and drug overdoses. People are urged to call 911 and stay until help arrives. More information at opioidresponse.info. You're listening to Georgia Today. I'm Steve Fennessy. I'm joined by Ryan December. He's a reporter from the Wall Street Journal who covers raw materials and the timber market. Ryan, in, in anticipation of our conversation, I texted the other day with my brother, who's a home builder in North Carolina, and he said that prices coming down has certainly helped. The people who had been putting projects on hold are now jumping back in, and so now availability is an issue. Um, is that Are you seeing that, like, nationwide? I would say that that's pretty accurate for what we hear from builders. You're still going to pay a lot, and you might not get what you need. Is the government getting involved at all in terms of trying to incentivize less planting of timber or to, to keep them from being cut down? The government does pay uh, people to plant longleaf and to grow longleaf pine, which is the original sort of dominant species throughout the South. Government programs these days are really focused on getting people to restore that habitat. There's also carbon markets that are emerging. Companies are under great pressure to show their acting with uh, the environment in mind and trying to make up for the pollution that they generate doing business. So give me some examples of how companies are doing this. Yeah, so they're purchasing carbon offsets oftentimes. JetBlue is one of those places doing it. Delta does it to some degree. British Airways is going to do exactly what JetBlue is doing, which is offset their domestic flights. And one of the things that they're doing now is paying people to not cut down trees, to leave their trees growing and thus absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. And they then turn around and, and take credit for that carbon being stored in the trees. So there are some options sort of getting away from that that could take some land sort of out of that rotation. Can you quantify how much of Georgia is devoted to, to, to pine tree harvesting? I mean, is there, has that gone up? Has it gone down? Uh, you know, I think it's been pretty stable over the last few decades. So forest covers roughly two-thirds of Georgia. Georgia has very little, like, federal and state forest. Most of it is in private hands and can be cut down. The state brings in something like eight or $900 million a year in tax revenue. The state says it's got about, you know, 147,000 jobs tied to forest products and forestry. And, you know, that goes all the way from the people growing the trees to the people who drive the trucks for the logging company to the people working at mills or place that makes utility poles or window sills. It's a huge industry in Georgia. Georgia is to wood products what Texas is to oil. That's not going to change. 
Now, on the margins, some people may not replant, or some people may take government money and replant longleaf for habitat restoration and pine straw. That's what's interesting about the carbon market. You have two markets for the same uh, thing, for the tree. You have one market that will pay you to cut it down, take it to the mill, and you have another market that will pay you to leave it standing. Where's all this going? What, what can we expect in terms of lumber prices six months or, or a year down the road? The last time that lumber prices were this high, we probably have 15 to 20 percent more houses being built now than we did then, which would signal that barring some significant collapse in, in that market and in the what we call the repair and remodel, you know, if everything just sort of stays where it is, you would expect to have lumber prices high in this range, high for history, not out of this world like we had this summer. People don't think that's coming back. As prices come down, will those savings be passed on to home builders, to people renovating? Builders are not lowering their prices. Builders are continuing to push prices high. And that goes back to interest rates being so low, you know, and demand so high. They're naming their price and their term for houses. So their costs are going down as the price of raw materials, i.e. lumber, goes down, but they're not necessarily passing those savings on to the end buyer. Not yet. You know, they've had a bad decade. They've had some hard times. And so now's the time to reap profits, kind of like the sawmills. Now everyone's sort of making the money that they missed out on and doing the business that they haven't done for years with, or post housing bus. So if you go out to buy a new home and you looked at a house in a development uh, a couple months ago and you're going back to that development, you shouldn't expect to see the price come down. But if you were thinking about building a deck, you might get a better price you know, this autumn than you did this spring. So sawmills are doing well, home builders are doing well, but the growers themselves are still kind of stuck. They are the ones left behind in this. But all these people sort of have the same conundrum is, what do we do going forward? It's such a commitment to grow these trees. You know, you pay property taxes for 30 years before you get a return. Is it something that they see as a, a viable industry going forward? That's the big question, right? Is like, okay, if I hand this down to my children, am I giving them an asset or am I giving them a liability? Right now, given the way the market is, it looks like a liability. Who's to say, you know, 30 years from now what, what that would be or even 15 years down the road? And so you have a lot of that going on where people are thinking, do we bind the next generation to this? You know, the mills probably are looking at the situation saying, our raw material is low price, that's great. You know, we're making a lot of money. At some point, though, you have to make sure that the people sort of supplying you are taken care of, or otherwise they might get out of the business. And there's also, we as a society, are, we're starting to look at the woods and look at trees and value them very differently. Like, we don't just look at them and see board feet of lumber or however much pulp you could make or get for the pulp wood. People are looking at them saying, how much carbon are they sequestering? What are they doing for the water quality? What do they do for just shade and recreation and just general well-being? Investors are pressuring companies to act more environmentally friendly. It's a bit of a shady world, or at least it was a shady world when it started out. Now it's a fairly regulated market, and you have a pretty good chance of them doing what they say they're doing. But in many ways, environmentalists say that you're kind of kicking the can down the road. One of the easiest things that companies can do in this very challenging problem of wringing carbon from their global operations is to look at their packaging and their components and say, what is made out of plastic that we can replace with something made out of paper or tree fiber? So there's a lot of research and development going on uh, in those worlds. There's a lot of people looking at the forests as solutions to some of the environmental problems that we have, especially as we think about what humans have done. To the environment in recent years, and trees are one of the things we have going for us that can clean up a lot of our messes. My thanks to Wall Street Journal reporter Ryan December for joining us. Lumber prices have fallen in recent weeks, but housing market analysts say buyers may not notice significant savings anytime soon. It's also possible that this new surge in COVID cases could increase demand yet again for new homes. We saw demand skyrocket at the start of the pandemic as people looked for homes with more space. For more Georgia Today, go to gpb.org. I'm Steve Fennessy. Georgia Today is a production of Georgia Public Broadcasting. Subscribe to our show anywhere you get podcasts. 
Don't forget to leave us a review on Apple. Jess Mador is our producer. The episode's engineers are Jesse Neiswanger and Jahi Whitehead. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.